Yeah, hi everybody, thank you for coming along. Um, yeah, it's a real shame Chris can't be here. I was really looking forward to co-presenting with him, um, but I figure that's a pretty reasonable excuse. Uh, so this is all, this all comes from the Christchurch earthquake. Um, I appreciate some people might be sick of hearing about Christchurch, uh, but for some of us it's still you know, an everyday issue. Uh, that was my old workplace at Kenan Chambers in Hereford Street in Christchurch, um, February 2011, about 15 minutes after the quake. Um, and this is a, 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 um, a presentation about some projects that are aiming to preserve uh, materials that came out of the earthquake. Um, in particular, uh, the Skirt Learning Legacy Project. Um, and this is all about a project to, to capture material um, that's been developed from Skirt, which is the uh, infrastructure rebuild team. It's a consortium of multiple uh, uh, companies working on horizontal infrastructure. Um, and when we say hor horizontal infrastructure, it's all things like the underground piping and so forth. Um, some of it isn't very horizontal anymore. Um, and a lot of it is you know, wastewater pipes, uh, all the underground services that we rely on, but they tend to be out of sight, out of mind. But in this case, we're having to rebuild you know, half a city in, in the space of you know, under a decade. So coming out of that um, are a lot of lessons, and, and they're not the kind of lessons that, that we learn every day. So there's an opportunity here to preserve some of that for, for the future. Uh, so a project was set up, a collaboration between SKIRT and the Earthquake Research Centres at University of Canterbury. Uh, and SKIRT want to communicate their rebuild work uh, and their objectives are to capture new ideas and new approaches that they've been forced to introduce to, you know, when you're rebuilding on such a big scale in such a short time period, uh, you've got to get really efficient and, and develop innovative uh, approaches to things. Um, and they want to share their knowledge um, nationally and internationally in a way that's, that's you know, under, can be understood by a wide range of people. Uh, there's also Seismic, which is the research consortium um, collecting digital content coming out of the earthquakes and uh, creating an archive for future research. And Quake Studies is the repository that is supporting that whole Seismic project. Uh, there's the Quake Centre, which is a research industry funded research centre uh, typically focused on, on engineering and promoting awareness of earthquake hazards and engineering solutions. Uh, resilient organisations, a uh, research group focused on organisational resilience from many perspectives, including engineering, management, uh, psychology, uh, sociology and business. And then Catalyst IT, and I have to point out here, I've got to give due credit to Learning Media, because they were the original builders of the Quake, uh, Quake Studies archive, and Catalyst picked up the support contract after Learning Media went out of business. Um, and full credit to Jason Darwin, who was the primary information architect for the system. Um, and there's some really quite interesting themes that come out of this. Um, this is a, a sculpture, a mural called, uh, by Wayne Yule, called I Seem to Have Temporarily Misplaced My Sense of Humour. Um, and there's a lot of things that are very temporary in Christchurch these days. Uh, and the, you know, the one in 2000 earthquake kind of is another reflection on time and and you know what might be temporary in 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 a earth sense is not temporary by New Zealand standard uh, by human standards. It's about lost things, um, loan tools, possessions, pets, lost relationships, that kind of thing. It's about um, the power of memory to return us to some kind of order uh, that we want to impose on on a possibly random and capricious world. Uh, the work done by agencies to rebuild the city is temporary. Most of these agencies like Skirt and Sarah and CCDU have all got very limited lifespans, and so part of this is preserving the work that they have done uh, or the how they did it, the why they did it. Um, a lot of money is going into the infrastructure rebuild, billions of dollars, and, and it's time to, to document it right now uh, before all of these agencies disappear and the staff uh, leave. And so the learning legacy concept is, is an intervention to try to capture this kind of information and share it. Uh, and preserve it. Uh, so like I say, a lot of this is underground, so it's effectively invisible, especially once the work's done. I mean, everybody in Christchurch will complain about the traffic and the disruption to roads, and this is why they're being disrupted. Um, but once the work's done, it's out of sight, and most people won't even know uh, what was done. So it's all about, uh, it's, it's part cultural heritage, um, part research project, 
the whole idea is to, to make things visible. Um, and it, that's especially important when such a major program of engineering is all underground. Uh, Skirts learning legacy is important both to the general public and to specialists, to planners, engineers and project managers, um, people who are keenly interested in the knowledge that's come out of the Christchurch experience. Um, Skirt has been recognised by the Institute of Civil Engineers in the UK for its engineering innovation. Um, and the learning legacy in some ways is a bit about PR uh, also. Um, but it does prompt scrutiny of what gets preserved and, and why. Um, and there are other organisations that could benefit from going through this kind of exercise. So the learning legacy concept itself, um, capture information now before it disappears. Uh, Skirt are due to wind up in December 2016. Um, develop an archive program that could be applied to multiple agencies. Uh, so there's already been been working with other uh, agencies like Gapfiller, for example. Um, and uh, although seismic represents the cultural heritage sector, uh, this is you know a more kind of precise, focused project on, on engineering information. Um, but this could be useful to other cities as well. Uh, there's also some scholarships uh, that have, there, there are already some scholarships that, have, that are underway for currently funded. Um, at master's level, um, including one looking at um, art collections management. Uh, and it's an also an opportunity to develop the platform as a whole, uh, because all of the components of this are open source, they're all available to other people. So what was the process that was gone through to, to get there? So uh, initially, the Skirtland Legacy Project uh, conducted some audience analysis, and they interviewed uh, a lot of stakeholders, uh, including organisations like Fulton Hogan, uh, Fletcher's, Becker, Littleton Port Company, Christchurch City Council, uh, various others to figure out what kind of information would they be looking for you know, to, to, to take on board some of these lessons. And also some research, especially around the categories that people might use to find this kind of information if they're searching for it. Uh, then was some design work. Catalyst did a few, few upfront designs and they chose the elements of those and came up with the, the design for the site. Um, which is all pretty simple because at the end of the day it's just presenting information and uh, the, the presentation of it, it um, doesn't have to be that sophisticated. And out of that came, came a data model um, which included categorising the content into themes, uh, things like communication, uh, design, uh, construction, finance, all of these aspects. Uh, and the idea was that that also came out of this was the idea to reuse the Quake Studies repository that was already in place, already had a lot of data from other areas. It made a lot of sense rather than build a completely parallel infrastructure to store this information, put it in Quake Studies, and then put a front end on it that was tuned to the specifics of the Skirt Learning Legacy Project. And then the themes, you drill down on the themes and you get to individual stories. And that was basically an, art uh, an articulation of a, of a problem or a challenge and how it was overcome and what solutions were applied. And this is the kind of thing that people can, can potentially benefit from. Uh, and those stories, uh, this, that's just a teaser text. If you click through onto that, there'll be more information about the overall story. And then it's supported by various attachments, uh, which are often engineering diagrams or, or forms, PDF forms, or whatever that were used uh, to, you know, in, in the process of developing the solution. And it might include flyers and brochures and public communications material, that kind of stuff. Um, there's a capacity to add video, audio, that kind of thing as well. So the Quake Studies uh, data structure is reasonably complex. Um, I won't bring that up now because I'm not online, but there is a whole ontology behind that. Um, and if you look at the slides later, you can click through to that. But a very simple part of it is the whole idea of a collection. And those co that can be a nested hierarchy of collections. And then it's associated with a collection as a part. And that's typically um, your, sorry, it should be an object. And then associated with as part of a collection, you have objects, and then inside objects, you have the parts. And that's what we then map to um, over here. So, sorry, that's slide, the slide this label. So, in the Quake Studies information architecture, you had collections, nested collections, and objects, and then parts. And over on the Skirtland and Legacy side, you had this idea of themes and stories and attachments. 
And what we had is a relatively straightforward mapping from one set to the other so that we could talk to the skirt people with the language that they were understanding and map that to the existing ontology that was inside Quake Studies. Now, I just skipped over the data model inside Fedora Commons. Um, just for those who aren't familiar with Fedora Commons, there's an institutional repository solution that's Java-based. It's very heavy on XML. Um, all of the content has persisted to disk on XML. And it uses a triple store and, and MySQL and things as a kind of operational reporting engine. But all of the data is basically in data streams uh, that are encoded, serialized in XML. So you've got your Dublin core um, and your relationship, your rels X, which is the relationships, the external relationships from a given object to any other objects. That's where you can get your hierarchies and your, your sequences, galleries, and so forth. And then your individual data streams, which may or may not exist depending on the nature of the con of the object, but it could be a thumbnail or an image or a sound file or a video file or whatever, and those are all captured in that, that model. So here's an example of a story with a title, text, supporting metadata, and it might be associated with a bunch of PDFs, for example. So in terms of, of Coming up with, okay, at this stage we knew that we wanted to reuse the existing Quake Studies, uh, the, the Fedora Commons part of Quake Studies, and fortunately it had an API, but the question was how to do a front end that was specific to Skirt. And we came up with a few options, a really lightweight wrapper using a simple framework like Django or maybe Node.js, because all it would have to do would be to yank data out of the API and display it. Um, we could extend the remote entities approach, which is a Drupal approach uh, using Drupal content management system that Quake Studies is already using for its main site uh, as it was developed by Learning Media. That was another option. Uh, and that was potentially more interesting to people because it kind of preserved Skirt's options. If they wanted to add social media th sharing or forums or uh, some more interactive features, then having a full-blown CMS kind of gave them a bit more flexibility there. And then the other option was to use another Drupal-based system called Islandora, which unfortunately at the time that Quake Studies was built was kind of a bit uh, too early in the game to go with, but it's, developed, it's, it's come a long way since then, and it's definitely a viable contender for this kind of project. So we had a look at all of those and decided that the simplest was to extend the existing approach that Learning Media had chosen, which was the remote entities. Um, just to give you a very quick picture of the architecture, uh, over here you've got Fedora Commons, and it has an API on it, it has some internal data stores, obviously it's all XML under the hood, um, but these are kind of operational data stores. Data um, content in Fedora Commons is, is extracted using G-Search and put into a solar instance for searching, so that provides a search capability, and it's also extracted for OIA and goes out to Digital New Zealand, so it's another way to access the material. Uh, and then the existing Drupal CMS Four Quake Studies is up in the corner, and that, that talks to, Drew, uh, to Fedora Commons to get data in and out. So that's the public interface for most people. If they're browsing or searching, they're going through Drupal, and it's talking to these back-end APIs. So what we introduced is another Drupal instance, but we changed a few things around. So one of the first things we did was use the Tuk library from Islandora, and that's, uh, so apparently I found that Tuk is Canadian for beanie, the hat. Uh, and so rather than develop a whole new a whole interface wrapper, we just reused that existing capability that Islandora project had already provided us. So that was a win for open source. Uh, Drupal itself is open source. And since the time that Quake Studies was first put together, the whole remote entities concept had been uh, progressed by the Drupal community to the point where it was um, really a robust solution. And so we reused that. One difference at the moment is if you do a search on Quake Studies, you're going to the solar instance that's fed by Fedora Commons. Whereas for our purposes, it made more sense to have a local solar instance to the Drupal for, uh, for Skirt. And the idea there is that when you enter the ID of an object in Fedora Commons, it gets pulled across by remote entities into Drupal. And once it's in Drupal, you can do all of the wonderful Drupal-y things uh, like, like um, querying and forms and tokenization, all the kind of presentational stuff and management stuff that you'd expect from a CMS. So it makes it a really powerful kind of capability that as soon as you've used the remote entities approach to full, effectively full Drupal into thinking it's dealing with local content, you then get the full spectrum of all of the content management features, even though the content itself is actually coming from an external system. 
Um, and there's a few twixt, tricks to that. So for example, we pull images across into the Skirt Learning Legacy project and display them. We pull PDFs across and index them in that solar instance, but we don't choose to pull videos across because you know, in many cases they're, they're huge in size. So if somebody requests a video through the Skirt Learning Legacy site, we just stream it behind the scenes straight out of Fedora Commons rather than duplicating it in another location. Um, so just to give you some idea of how some of these things might look, um, if we have a look at this Quake Studies is in a top collection within, oops, that's not going to work today. Okay, not online right now. Um, the thing to get across here is that all of this content is in Quake Studies and is browsable in Quake Studies. And then it's been pulled through into Skirt Learning Legacy and presented in a different way, but it's the same material. Um, so what are some of the lessons arising from this? Uh, one of the first would be that multi-stakeholder um, consortiums are hard work, a lot of conflicting agendas and uh, needs, and so that was a constant battle for everybody, but I think there was, there was generally a fair amount of goodwill, um, but you know, we're still, still working on this, and you know, still, still people wanting to be satisfied. Uh, reuse is possible. I think this is a really good demonstration of reuse, both in terms of architecture and code. Um, so using open source components from pretty much from top to bottom means that we can reuse this and the wider community can benefit as well. Um, and I think one of the other things is, that comes out of this is a demonstration that open source communities are delivering increasingly powerful capabilities. I mean, um, from Drupal as a CMS, from Solar as a search system, as Fedora Commons from an institutional repository point of view, the, the capabilities are just continually accruing um, at a quite a substantial rate and getting really, really impressive. And that big problems like earthquakes can be big opportunities to experiment with new approaches and to learn new things. Um, so I should say thanks to Skirt and the Quake Centre and Resilient Organisations for backing this, um, and of course to University of Canterbury um, and to Catalyst IT for, for getting me here. Um, what's next? The, the collection that we're talking about is available under the Quake Studies URLs, so you can go there and visit that. Um, and we're working to put some of the code that we've built on GitHub so that other people can benefit. And um, the Skirt Learning Legacy site, unfortunately, is not live at this moment but it should be live any day now, I hope. Um, just attributing a few images there, and um, if anybody wants to follow up on the real technical nitty gritty, you could talk to me afterwards, uh, or follow some of these links uh, around how the remote entity stuff works. Um, these slides are available on GitHub, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for your time. Got any questions? Jonathan and Chris in, in absentia. Um, if I got it right, you're archiving the actual design process that leads to actual rebuild projects. Or are you also archiving the design thinking that goes behind projects that don't see the light but for whatever reason, are still archived as potential future ways of approaching specific problems. Yeah, Chris would probably have a better handle on the spectrum of stories that have been developed, but I think there's a few hundred in play. I mean, I, I, not all 200 are currently ingested in the system, but they span a real range. So some of them are, are just like public relations campaigns about handing out chocolate fish at roads, at roadworks just to encourage people to behave in a civil fashion and to acknowledge that they were inconvenienced but there was a reason why they were inconvenienced at one end. And then there's um, you know, design diagrams and, and solutions for you know, fairly substantial you know, underground works and for siphons and for all sorts of you know, civil engineering things that I'm not that familiar with. So it's a real spectrum of, of uh, artifacts that have been captured. Does that answer your question? I guess the question is, are you archiving what hasn't worked? Um, you'd have to ask Skirt how many of those things that they've put in there are, are kind of examples of maybe experiments that didn't work out. Um, I don't know. From a PR point of view, maybe not so much, but 
Um, they might have said that you know these, these are things that work for us, but there's no guarantee that they would work in other situations because of the the requirements of the earthquake rebuild, you know, and the time frames that they were working with. Uh, you know, they might have been working on different kind of um, you know have slightly different drivers that may not always be applicable to other other cases. Yeah. But I mean, it would make sense. I, I, I'm not sure enough about the content, but I could certainly find out for you. Because I'm curious about the learning objects, um, how they're translating stories into learning objects for the learning legacy to implement by the ITOs, for example, in their apprenticeship programs, and you know, what's, what's the trajectory to make them I mean, that's a really good question. It would tangible. make a huge amount of sense to try to reuse some of these real-world examples, but I mean, that would be up to, the, you know, to those training organizations if they see value in this once it's public. Sure. Um, can you just clarify the use cases for the two different front ends? Sure. Um, so the Quake Studies um, front end, well, I'll go to the... Oh, sorry, big one. So the front end for Script Learning Legacy is very tuned just to their stories and how to find their stories. And the whole idea is that you know the search engines will pick this up. So anybody who happens to be searching for Christchurch and you know underground infrastructure is going to land here. Uh, Quake Studies is a much broader collection of material, and there's all sorts of stuff on there, ranging from individual um, blog posts that have been captured to to uh, you know videos from the Quakebox project and newspaper pages and a whole bunch of stuff. So it's kind of it's a much broader research platform, whereas this is very focused on just this. But the beauty is that you know, we can do both with this infrastructure. We can provide the really wide general pool of content for people who are researching across a whole range of different kind of ideas or, or, um, or media. And here we can provide something that's really focused on a very specific use case for a pretty specific audience. I should point out that James has been a fairly major player in all of this. Yeah, I'm James Smithies. I was involved in um, developing and project managing Quake Studies and Seismic. Um, there's, there's an interesting thing with, you know, I call, used to call these sort of satellite sites or third party sites. And the goal on day one with Seismic or Quake Studies was eventually to have hundreds of these things. And, and in a way, it was to offer content providers something extra. So when we first went to Fairfax Media, for instance, and people said, oh, they'll never give you the their content. We said, well, you know, we'll put your content into Quake Studies, but you could potentially have a third party site that showcased just your content so that it wouldn't be subsumed by all the other content within Seismic. Um, turned out that Fairfax and most of the other companies that we talked to said Quake Studies is fine and we don't need it. And this is really the first use case that's appeared where a company has said, no, we really need our own site and that's the only way that, you know, that, that, that provides the motivation to give us to um, gift our content to you. So it's quite a nice um, sustainability feature, I think, for projects like this. Um, so with it being the first of its kind in that way, um, do you have plans to monitor use or... Um close that feedback loop back from users in terms of future potential? Yeah, um, there's definitely plans in SCIRT. Uh, they, they would like to see this, you know, picked up around the world. I've received really good feedback so far. I don't think I mentioned, to be honest, that it was, um, this is based on the Learning Legacy project that came out of the London Olympics. Um, so, you know, this has been done before or something along these lines. Um, and so, this is kind of probably a relatively quick follow-up to that kind of thing, but it's a pattern that could be, you know, replicated across a whole range of kind of industries and, and uh, you know, subject matter uh, areas. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it would be really good. We, we did talk about ways of citing this material and all that kind of stuff, but it's because it tends to be mainly looked at by engineers um, doing research and so on, it's... It's not necessarily something that's going to show up by following, say, a Twitter stream or Facebook links or anything like that. So it's a, it's kind of a bit of a undefined question right now, but it's definitely people are thinking of that. I think if we talk about that, you know, if we're looking back in 50 years' time, the legacy became real. I think this is actually the sort of thing we need. Like we need that big data 
market. So we can do sort of an integrated market. Um, but I think we also want to be able to go to these front windows as well. That's why I'd like to see 50 or 100 of them, of all these different companies and NGOs um, dotted around because it moves away from a sort of the, trying to create a big silo. Um, yeah. And it's interesting that it's only four years after we first went live that we have our first third party site. So the size of the model is now complete. The last chance for questions. Okay, so I believe we are now on afternoon break uh, back in Oceana, uh, and then we'll have the final session of the afternoon uh, in soundings. And thanks to all our speakers this afternoon and everyone who is asking questions and participating in the audience as well.